yeah. Okay, let's get going. So no swear words. <laughs> um, yes, hello. So we're meeting under quite uh, extraordinary circumstances today. But, um, <clears throat> well, I think uh, most of us find out that online work uh, works better than, than most of us expected. But it does have uh, some limitations, though. And personally, I, <clears throat> I miss uh, seeing my students in class, I have to admit. The last day of university, I went to uh, our empty classroom, and it felt a bit weird to uh, realize I wouldn't be seeing that again for a long time. So, um, <clears throat> so my name is uh, Sebastian Weisberger, and I'm uh, currently professor for um, environmental sciences and chemistry at uh, Université de Moncton in the Chipagan campus. So for for those of you who have been to New Brunswick, it's um, in the Acadian Peninsula, way out to the to the top right, and uh, a very nice region. And usually, I'm uh, located in Montreal. Actually, I work for uh, <clears throat> the Teluk University, which is a distance learning university, and uh, or UCAM, Université du Québec à Montréal in the environmental sciences. And basically my background is in natural sciences, but now I work a lot in the climate change adaptation projects, uh, especially with coastal zones and different uh, collaborative uh, projects with different intervenors like NGOs and uh, ministries and uh, public organizations, municipalities, so we work with uh, all kinds of uh, people and it's always based on teamwork and co-constructing knowledge and adaptation planning. So that's uh, what I do for a living. And, and so today we'll talk a bit about uh, climate change and we were uh, having this uh, uh, these workshops on uh, climate change educators which were actually mostly from a university background and we um, agreed that it would be a good idea to sh share some information and knowledge and so the presentation I prepared today was actually more, more Mostly, I thought it would be more people from academia showing up, and now I see that it's mostly, or pretty much exclusively, people from the, the Canadian Wildlife Foundation. So that's great. I'm very happy, and I hope the talk is is not going to be like too technical in in some aspects. But um, if uh, something seems very unclear, you can always uh, type something. In, in the chat window and, and we can uh, work it out. And then after the talk, we can have uh, questions anyways. Um, I'm not sure how long we programmed the seminar for, but uh, I'm sure there's going to be some time. OK, so we will talk a bit about, so basically an introduction to climate change science and, and how the climate is uh, changing and especially why it's changing so some aspects of the earth's radiation balance or budget as you want to put it's uh, what are greenhouse gases And how do they work? A bit of an earth history perspective. So, um, how do current climate change that we observe compare to what happened in the in the past? 
and uh, but the discovery of climate change science, which is something that's always been very interesting to uh, retrace how we actually found out about climate change and, and when this all became an uh, issue for scientists. And then at the end, I want to talk a bit about, about the carbon cycle, which is something that, um, as a chemist, is something that interests me particularly. So. Maybe I'll go into too much detail there, but um, I hope that's okay for you. Voila. And, and since we're giving this talk in French as well, you will see on most slides there is French and English. Because I just made one uh, set of slides for both presentations. So if you don't know what's written on a certain line, it's probably because it's uh, in French. And if you don't talk French, then that's probably why. So there's always, um, always start. But in my classes, to uh, present a simplified version of the greenhouse effect. So we're basically sitting, in, the Earth is sitting in a greenhouse gas, and our industries are heating up the atmosphere and warming everything up. Um, so that's not completely wrong, but uh, certainly not the whole that there is to it. So the more complicated answer goes through the, uh, the radiation budget of, uh, of the Earth and how this radiation um, contributes <clears throat> to heating up the Earth. So in principle, of course, it's all the energy that um, that we get from <clears throat> that the Earth has to use uh, comes from the sun. So the the, the solar radiation is uh, the, the main, if not only, almost source of energy on on the surface of the Earth. And of course, that is uh, under the form of uh, electromagnetic radiation. some of which is light, some of which is other frequencies as well. And then there is um, this thing called a black body. I don't know if you uh, are familiar with that, but a black body, it's, um, it's a hypothetical body that is able to absorb any kind of electromagnetic radiation of any frequency of any wavelength and this is what's called a black body because it does not emit any light it just absorbs everything so it would have no visible color to show and when you analyze such a black body it's um, will always end up being in an equilibrium between the energy it receives um, in any shape or form, but mostly through the radiation, and the radiation it emits itself, which is the little sorry red arrow that you can see at the top. So every black, black body gets heated to a certain temperature and emits a radiation that is proportional to the temperature. And uh, we'll get to that. So, of course, the Earth is not a perfect black body because um, when we look at the Earth from space, we can see it has all kinds of colors, uh, blue and green and red and yellow. So it does uh, reflect a certain part of the sunlight. But the analogy with a black body is still useful because it allows to calculate um, energy balances and uh, radiation balances. So at any uh, incoming radiation, there is an equal amount of outgoing 
bring radiation. So that means that in the long term, the radiation uh, budget should always be zero, and that always this uh, equilibrium. Uh, establishes itself at a certain temperature. The more radiation comes in and out, the higher the temperature, and the lower the radiation that comes in and comes out, the lower the temperature. But it's always in a it works in a steady state condition. And there are some equations that uh, some physical laws that allow us to understand how this uh, radiation works. So the radiation of a black body, that is the amount of energy or of, uh, radiative power that any black body emits is proportional to the temperature. And if you see the big equation here, that's called the Stefan Boltzmann law, uh, the link between the uh, outgoing radiative power, so that's in joules per second, it's proportional to the temperature to the power of force. So it depends very uh, importantly on the temperature, and that's a law that was discovered by a physicist called uh, Josef Stefan. in 1879 and was uh, theoretically founded by uh, famous uh, <coughs> physical chemist Ludwig Boltzmann in 1884. So that's been known for uh, quite a while. So that's one of the laws. Same in French. And then the other law that allows us to uh, understand what frequencies or wavelengths of light are emitted by a black body, that's called the Wien's displacement law by an um, Austrian, I think, uh, physicist uh, of the name Wien. And there we can see that the, the wavelength, the lambda max, the maximum wavelength, is inversely proportional to the temperature. So that means the hotter a body is, the shorter the wavelength of the light will be, which makes sense because the energy of light um, um, increases with decreasing wavelengths. So if you have a high amount of energy to dissipate, then the body will emit light of a short wavelengths and very high energies. And you can see it's not a single, as you can see from those uh, curves here, it's not a single wavelength that is emitted, but a whole spectrum of wavelengths and the shape of the spectrum depends really on the temperature of the black body. So if you look at the sun that has about 5,800 Kelvin in temperature, uh, that will be, it's hard to see on this graph, but I'll show you later. And the earth has about uh, Two hundred and fifty-four Kelvin, so that's a much lower wavelength. So I'm just going to break in for a sec. But five hundred, five thousand to ten thousand um, nanometers. I just want to see if anybody has any questions or wants to put a hand up or anything. Beyond the visible light. So if you remember um, a bit about your physics, the electromagnetic. Magnetic spectrum has visible light somewhere in the middle of it, but there's of course all the frequencies, uh, the, the wavelengths which 
a longer than visible light that is uh, in waves and micro and radio waves and at higher energies we have uh, ultraviolet light and x-rays and gamma rays but they're all part of the same uh, spectrum so it's uh, they're no different in their nature than uh, than visible light So if we look at the sun, for, ex for example, the sun behaves uh, almost like a perfect black uh, body. So <clears throat> the, um, the shape in gray that's in this figure would be the calculated distribution of wavelengths according to the, the Wien law for the particular temperature of the sun's surface, which is around 6,000 uh, kelvins which is about 5,700 degrees Celsius. And the real spectrum in yellow that is uh, depicted of the sun is uh, pretty much exactly what we would expect from see. So the sun behaves uh, almost like a black body and emits uh, this radiation around 500 and a bit around Uh, nanometers, which we perceive mostly as visible light, and of course that's normal because our, our uh, sensory organs, our eyes, evolved uh, in an environment where we could see the sun's radiation. So it was useful for our eyes to perceive that as a as visible light that we could uh, actually see. And other bodies of different temperatures have a very different emission spectrum. So at the top right, you can see the sun that's about 5,000 degrees. So that's kind of whitish or yellowish light, depending on where the, you know, where the sun is in the horizon. Um, to the left, you can see uh, burning coals. So uh, if you start a grill and you start heating up the coals, The coal on your grill, they, it will go from a deep red to, to a more yellowish color. And if we, you could heat it even further, it would become an orange and bright yellow. So it depends on the temperature. Right underneath the coal, you can see a nuclear explosion that produces a uh, very high temperatures, up to 100 million degrees, and that uh, emits visible light, but also a lot of uh, UV and even uh, radiation and even X-rays, which is a uh, very high energy radiation. And at the right, you can see uh, some person with a horse, and that, of course. Um, Well, the body temperature of uh, mammals about 37 degrees Celsius. It's uh, slightly above that of the Earth, so we don't have the same radiation than the Earth. It's a little bit more energetic, but it's still in the infrared spectra. So basically, we can't see the light that's emitted by a horse, but with um, with a <clears throat> with a camera equipment, we can. We can produce false colors, and thus we can uh, distinguish animals against the background of uh, someone that is somewhat colder. But the human eye can't see infrared radiation, of course. But it's a different frequency than what the Earth emits. So every body of every temperature has a specific wavelength that it will uh, emit. Okay, and in the particular case of the Earth, um, in the absence of an atmosphere, the, the radiation balance would mean the black body radiation would be somewhere in the infrared and the steady state temperature uh, would be around minus 15 degrees Celsius. So that would be the natural temperature of the surface of the Earth. But now, of course, 
we know that we do have an atmosphere, and in that atmosphere there are certain molecules uh, that we'll get to later that uh, absorb heat, that, that are able to um, absorb this infrared uh, radiation and then emit it again in a scattered uh, way. And that means, and that is, it's those molecules like water, CO2, methane, and uh, other ones that cause the, a certain heating of the atmosphere and of the Earth's surface. And so in the presence of uh, this atmosphere with the greenhouse gases, the Earth's surface temperature is about plus 15 degrees. So instead of minus 17, it's plus 15 degrees, so the entire difference that is due to uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere is about 33 degrees Celsius, that it's warmer than if we did not have an atmosphere. So it's quite a significant effect. And if we compare to this, the, the human increase of that effect, which is about, well, at the moment it's about a, a little bit more more than one degree, so we've uh, increased slightly that effect compared to uh, what it was uh, before human intervention. But it's only a part of the total greenhouse effect that uh, already exists and makes uh, Earth really uh, habitable. On top of having atmosphere is uh, quite useful when you want to breathe in oxygen. Okay, wow, this didn't turn out. Yes. Yeah, you can always type questions in the chat too. Yeah, so this slide didn't turn out very well. Um, I'll try to change it for Thursday. It's just a list of different greenhouse gases that are important in the atmosphere. Here. And uh, actually, the one that's the most important is uh, not included, which is water vapor. And, and there's reasons why. Uh, but basically, what makes a greenhouse gas a re greenhouse gas, really? Um, it depends on the the shape of the molecules, because in order to absorb infrared radiation, which is the heat radiation, uh, this radiation needs to resonate somewhere in the molecule and activate certain vibration energy levels that are exactly of the same uh, of the same energy than the incoming radiation. So it's only certain molecules which are present in the atmosphere that act as greenhouse gases, and other ones like nitrogen, for example, that's, uh, um, that is about 75% of uh, all the atmosphere, does not act as a greenhouse gas because it does not um, absorb those frequencies of infrared radiation that the Earth emits. emits and water vapor does so, but uh, why don't we consider water vapor as a greenhouse gas? It's uh, very simple because the cycle of water vapor is so quickly, so fast, that it really adjusts almost daily to the, the temperature of the Earth. So if the temperature is higher, then more, greenhouse, more uh, water will evaporate from the oceans, and if the temperature which it drops, it might uh, precipitate again. So it's a greenhouse gas that rather adjusts to the temperature than the other way around. So the other uh, quality a greenhouse gas uh, has is that it has to be uh, to stay in the atmosphere for a certain amount of time in order to uh, influence the climate. And of those, the most important 
important is, of course, uh, carbon dioxide, which I'm sure you all uh, know about. Uh, carbon dioxide stays in the atmosphere for quite a while. It, and it depends on which fraction remains, but it can be uh, some years or it can be some millennia even. So uh, I'll try to explain a bit of that at the end. And, and uh, the second most important greenhouse gas is uh, methane, which is in present in much uh, smaller concentrations, but has a higher, what we call a global warming potential. That's the column all the way to the right, um, where carbon dioxide is defined as one, and the other ones have a global warming potential. And that simply means that every molecule of, uh, for example, methane is 25 times is more effective than CO2 to heat up the climate. And that is caused, uh, has two causes. One is that uh, methane is more effective at absorbing infrared radiation. And the other one is that methane tends to stand in the atmosphere for uh, somewhat longer, but not much longer than CO2. But you see uh, other gases, which we have, like uh, N2O, nitrous oxide, uh, has a much higher global warming potential and stays in the atmosphere for uh, much longer. And then you have a long list of uh, uh, molecules, which are basically um, uh, uh, chloride and fluoride hydrocarbons, which are all artificial molecules, including um, SF6 as well, uh, sulfur hexa, hexafluoride, all at the bottom. Those are all artificial molecules that are used for different um, industrial purposes as uh, maybe coolants or lubricants or those kind of things. And some of them stay in the atmosphere for a very, very long time. Um, you can see, for example, perfluoromethane has a lifetime of about 50,000 years in the atmosphere, so it really stays there pretty much forever as far as we're concerned. And therefore, they have a very high global warming potential, and even though they're present in very small concentrations, they do actually have an important role on the climate. And what is interesting about those molecules is that most of them are also molecules that are um, uh, precisely because they're very stable, that are also precursors of uh, stratospheric ozone depletion. Therefore, most of those molecules are also regulated under the Montreal Protocol. That, um, if you, you know that, maybe I don't know who knows the Montreal Protocol, but it's the protocol that was signed in 1986, I believe, uh, that was devised to. Uh, to fight the, the, the ozone hole, basically. So they're, in principle, all phased out or in, in the process of being phased out of industrial production. So in that sense, the Montreal Protocol had a, a huge impact on climate change. It helped a lot to uh, mitigate uh, climate change, maybe just as much as the, as the Kyoto Protocol itself. So that's the main greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere. And the one that we're most concerned about is carbon dioxide because that directly um, originates from the combustion of the fossil fuels that we use and in part to deforestation. And methane has various other sources, but lots of those sources are really uh, dependent on feedbacks with land use change and with the climate change itself. So it's very difficult to regulate methane as such. It's more like a gas that happens to feed back. And nitrous oxide, mm, that comes from uh, mostly from agriculture. In excess of fertilizers and pastures and monocultures tend to uh, produce a lot of uh, nitrous oxide. So that's our main greenhouse gases that we're concerned about. Voilà. No, that's right. Click here. Okay.
the Earth's radiation budget is um, really quite complicated in detail. So that's uh, an image of all the ingoing and outgoing fluxes. And uh, uh, if you want to work in an uh, at home a bit, you'll see that it's uh, almost balanced. And so, for example, the incoming radiation, so the big uh, yellow arrow, the incoming solar radiation is about 341.3 watts per square meter. So that's the unit in which it is uh, expressed. It's also uh, how we call, um, how we uh, measure radiative forcing. That's the excess of this uh, energy. So it's an um, amount of energy per square, square meter of the Earth. The surface and what comes out on the other sides, the, the outgoing long wave radiation, it's a number that's slightly smaller. It's 238.5 watts per square meters. And the difference between the two is basically what is absorbed by the Earth's uh, surface, which in that example, when they, they made this graph, was about 0 0.9 watts per square meters. Square meters. Uh, nowadays, due to the increase in greenhouse gases, it's gotten a bit more. It's about 1.6 watts per square meter, which doesn't sound like a lot. But if you imagine um, like a light bulb that uses, I don't know, 100 watts, so every 100 square meters of the Earth's surface, you could have a light bulb burning. And there's a lot of square meters in the Earth. So, uh, so over the whole surface of the Earth, it makes uh, um, a huge amount of energy that is stored every uh, that is stored continuously, and you see that there is different uh, fates that happen to to, um, to radiation. So the incoming solar radiation, some of it is reflected by the clouds at the top of the atmosphere, but is it is uh, absorbed and scattered in the atmosphere. Atmosphere itself, some of it uh, falls on the surface, and there are certain surfaces uh, at the surface of the Earth that uh, reflect a lot of radiation, and that's, for example, all the polar ice caps. They reflect uh, over 90% of all incoming radiation, whereas seawater is the opposite that uh, absorbs pretty much. all the radiation, which is why it looks very dark from uh, space. And then on the right hand of the picture, you see uh, um, that's basically the infrared radiation that gets emitted by uh, the Earth's surface. And there is a big upwards arrow and a big downwards arrow in the back radiation. That is really what is trapped by greenhouse gases and reflected back to the surface of the Earth, where it's again, again absorbed by the surface and re-emitted as a new surface radiation. And during all that process, this process of uh, reabsorbing and re-emitting it, the temperature of the Earth's surface will, uh, will continuously rise until it's found a new equilibrium. So that's what greenhouse gases do, really. And in the end, it uh, ends up escaping uh, from space to space. And basically, eventually, the temperature of the Earth's surface will uh, rise, which will increase the amount of energy that's emitted through surface radiation until it's exactly the same amount as that of incoming solar radiation. And that at that moment, we will have a new steady state with a new steady state temperature, which will be slightly higher than our temperature. And that, and of course, this process will only uh, be complete when we stop emitting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Then we can reach a new equilibrium, and that takes about 100 or 200 years to establish. <laughs>
And you can do all kinds of calculations for this graph if you have a time left over. But for example, you can show that the 161 watts per square meters that get absorbed by the Earth's surface is the same amount that that gets emitted by the Earth's surface. Through infrared radiation or transpiration or thermal convection, that's other processes that uh, allow the Earth's surface to uh, dissipate all the heat. But the main, the main thing to um, well, to, to remember from this graph is that there is a slight imbalance between the incoming solar radiation and what gets emitted as a long wave as a infrared radiation at the moment. And that's why the Earth's surface keeps heating up until that balance is established again. But the more greenhouse gases we have in the atmosphere, the higher the temperature will be at which this balance will be uh, reached again. So I hope that it's not too complicated. And if you have any questions, uh, uh, just let me know. So let's go to um, but how we understood all this or what, what happened to the greenhouse gases. This is one curve that you might have seen. Um, the Keeling curve, which uh, is a continuous record of atmospheric CO2 concentrations and that, has a, that started in 1958 because that was an international geophysical year. And the international community decided to build actually two CO2 observatories one of which was uh, built in Mauna Loa in uh, Hawaii. And it sits on the top of a volcano on an island in the middle of the Pacific. The idea here being to be very far from vegetation. So it's quite high up on the volcano and there's no vegetation around. And it's also very far from any other human activities except for what people on Hawaii do. So it's a pretty isolated spot. And the other station that unfortunately was never built was uh, supposed to be in the Antarctic, which also is uh, as remote as you can get. But uh, there was no funding for that. So we just uh, ended up with this one station here. But you can see very nicely since 1958 how uh, CO2 con concentrations uh, exponentially rise over time. You can also see there's a lot of a seesaw movement going on and uh, that's basically the seasonal cycles because there is an imbalance of continents in the in the world. There are more continents in the north and more uh, open ocean in the south. So basically during the year there is more uh, there's an imbalance of CO2 absorption and production over the seasons. So that's why you have this uh, seesaw pattern. But basically CO2 concentrations have been uh, exponentially rising since 1958 and, and probably before as well. And that's something that's very well known. And that of course goes in hand with an increase in the temperatures that we can show over different um, of the different time lags so in the past 140 years you can see that there is a quasi steady state uh, 1800 to 1900 this doesn't change very much and then it starts rising until 1940 there is a little drop until 1970 and then it starts uh, increasing again and um, if you look at it for the past thousand years, you see that there are some variations over the past uh, thousand years. So it, it always goes up and down quite a bit. 
but uh, at the end of the graph, if you look from about 1900 in the graph at the bottom, there was a very sharp increase in uh, temperature that really stands out from anything else that happened in the, the previous thousand years. And we can go back even further in time uh, to look at that for a uh, Oh, no, no, we we're still 1,000 years ago, I thought, in the other graph. But uh, what we see here, it's uh, if we show the projections, the different projections that we have depending on the different emission scenarios, uh, we can see that the temperatures that we might achieve in the future will be uh, quite considerably higher than anything we've had in the last 1,000 years in terms of natural variation. So we're uh, very far from anything we've known in recent history. Oh, yeah, I forgot to put the 10,000-year the graph in, but if you look at the same over 10,000 years, you'll see that the, the kind of variation we see over 10,000 years never exceeds like one degree up or down. And what we expect for the coming 100 years goes uh, way beyond that, uh, that natural range. So if we look at uh, CO2 concentrations, uh, you're all familiar with the uh, ice ages. Um, not so much from personal experience, although we do have people from Edmonton too. Um, but uh, in Canada, of course, we had those, uh, again, all the Northern Hemisphere, this al <coughs> alternation of uh, ice ages, cold periods and uh, warm periods. And CO2 concentrations uh, changed quite considerably during those uh, periods. And they were around maybe 180 or so uh, ppm, which is parts per million in the cold spells of ice ages, so very low CO2 concentrations. And they usually rose to about 280 parts per million during the warm periods, which we call interglacial periods, which is uh, incidentally what we're presently uh, living in. And, and actually, the whole of humanity has evolved during the last uh, interglacial, so about 10, 20,000 years ago. That's uh, where all our civilizations have strived. And since then, in the last years, we have exceeded 400 ppm of uh, parts per million of carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. Uh, the latest data, uh, it's uh, in March 2020, we've reached uh, 414.11 ppm uh, parts per million. So we can see that our uh, CO2 concentrations is, is way higher than it's been at any time since the those glaciations began, which was about a million years in the past. So we're about a third higher than the, the highest level that we've had over the, the past million years, which was a, a long time, right? And therefore, we might expect to have a climate that uh, might become much different from anything that we've experienced uh, in terms of human civilization or even the human evolution. And if we go back in Earth's history to find out, well, when was the last time that you had concentrations that would be around 400 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere, we have to go back to a uh, period in Earth's history that's called the Pliocene. So now, presently, we live in the Pleistocene. But if we go back to the Pliocene, and especially um, a time span that was about 3.4 to 3.6 million years ago, that's when we think that we had about the same amount of uh, CO2 concentrations, about 400 ppm of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, the first thing we see is that there was no northern ice. 
is kept during that time. Whereas nowadays we always have a northern ice cap and sometimes it's much larger during glacial episodes. So that's the earth on the way to the left. And sometimes it's very small like nowadays. That's the, the, the middle earth that we see. And the earth to the right, it's the earth during the Pleistocene and there was no uh, northern ice cap at all. And the climate was also rather different in the Pleistocene. Maybe not so much in overall temperatures. Um, during that time, the, the temperature was about two to three degrees higher than it's um, during our interglacial period. So nowadays, pretty much. Um, yeah, so it's, it's it's not a huge difference in terms of uh, worldwide averages, but for example, in the Arctic, there was a, a large difference. It was about eight degrees warmer in the Arctic than, uh, than it would be nowadays. Whereas the tropics stayed pretty much at the same uh, temperature. And, uh, a uh, very significant uh, difference existed in sea level because uh, from reconstructions we can make about sea levels, the sea levels were about 22 meters higher than nowadays sea levels. So that's quite a, a big change. And that's, uh, of course, we have to consider that's a climate that we have uh, fairly good data and that has about the same CO2 concentrations and maybe somewhat lower than we have nowadays. So basically, in, in the steady state with the atmosphere we have nowadays, that's the kind of climate that we will uh, reach. And that is, of course, assuming that we don't emit more CO2 into the atmosphere. So the more CO2 we emit on top of the 400 ppm we already have, the more the, dif the, 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 the higher the differences will be in temperature and the higher the sea level will rise as well. So that's uh, definitely something to be uh, concerned about. I see someone is uh, typing a question. When they used ice cores to measure past CO2 concentrations. So the question is, when they use ice cores to measure past CO2 concentrations, how far back have they been able to go? Can we measure up to 2 million years ago? Or were those measurements coming from different methods? Um, Yeah, that, that's that's a, a really good question because ice cores are, um, of course, dependent on the existence of uh, very old ice. And um, for example, in Greenland, the ice is not that old at all, so you can't uh, go that far. But in the Antarctic, there's some uh, really old ice and Well, I know at least from some ice cores, like in, in Vostok, which is the, the Russian station, that goes back uh, 800,000 years, and there might be some older ice that, that has been sampled, but it pretty much stops at 800,000 years in the past. And when we go further back than 800,000 years, then definitely you have to use different methods. And sometimes you can do measurements in the lakes. There, there is some lakes like, um, is it Tanganyika? I don't remember. Um, or Lake Baikal, which have uh, remained ice-free for, for Baikal for about 20 million years. And so in the sediments of those lakes, you can find all kinds of indicates based on vegetation and isotopic uh, 
signatures of, uh, of water and um, uh, foreign interfere and, and all kinds of creatures that uh, used to live there. So you can reconstruct uh, a lot of things. You can reconstruct temperatures and humidity, precipitation, and through that of the extent of ice sheets that existed in the past. Or, of course, there's a, there was a whole large program in the 1990s of uh, deep ocean drilling. So there's um, maybe 130 or more sites in the deep ocean that were drilled from ocean sediments. And those sometimes can reach back like hundreds. Uh, the Atlantic is about 200 million years old, so you can uh, theoretically uh, go as far as that. Practic practically, it's a bit difficult, but you can have that kilometer wide, uh, kilometer long uh, um, uh, uh, sediment cores that you can do analysis, and they reach back millions of years. So that's how you do. And, but of course, the further you go back in the past, the more uncertain those uh, uh, estimates are. So if you go back like hundreds or 200 million years, then it's, it's uh, very risky, uh, risky numbers, very uh, uncertain. And that's why the ice cores are very uh, precious because they give us like really hard numbers. The CO2 concentrations are extreme, extremely precise. But as soon as you leave that, it's uh, more indirect measures with more uh, errors in them. So that's why we look at the, the Pliocene, but there's of course some, the, the, there's a certain uncertainty. Certainty attached to it, but it's still not too far ago, so we can have a, a reasonably good uh, grip on that. And during the Pleistocene, of course, there were no modern humans around, and our closest ancestors were the uh, Australopithecus and our famous. Uh, Possible common ancestor Lucy, and what does she think of all that? That's pretty hard to know since we don't know what language, if any, they uh, uh, spoke. So that's a question that will remain unanswered. But of course, we know what, what scientists. I've been saying for um, much longer than most people realize, actually. Because the first article that was published on anthropogenic uh, climate change, uh, so a calculation of the warming that uh, would originate from human CO2 emissions, was from Asvante Arrhenius. And Probably really anyone who has had a chemistry at school or at university will remember his name because he's uh, invented quite a number of laws that every chemist has to learn by heart, like activation and energies of chemical reactions. And uh, so he was a brilliant chemist in his day. And in 1896, he published this article where he predicted that if we keep emitting CO2 as we do, if the quantity of carbonic acid, which is another name for CO2, increases in geometric progression, that means exponentially, the augmentation of the temperature will increase nearly in arithmetic progression, which is a linear increase. And there had been it's some work done before by a uh, by famous uh, scientist like Joseph Fourier, French scientist who was the first, I think, in the 1820s or so, to uh, realize that the Earth was actually much warmer than it should be according to its uh, black body radiation balance. So he 
already postulated the role of uh, heat trapping gases in the atmosphere that were causing this greenhouse effect and uh, the measurements by John Tyndall a bit later like 1860s or so who was an Irish um, chemist experimentalist who managed to uh, measure the absorption spectra of different uh, gases that are present in the atmosphere so from there we know which frequencies CO2 or HTO, etc., uh, absorb in the atmosphere. And so from those measurements, uh, Arrhenius was able to, to conclude that CO2 is a greenhouse gas that emits the kind of radiation that the Earth's atmosphere should uh, be emitting as heat radiation and if that is trapped by more CO2 in the atmosphere than the global warm-up. So it's not something that um, that has suddenly come up over the last years. It's a theory that has been there for uh, for more than a hundred years and it's based on such simple um, physical principles that it's uh, you could you should barely call it a theory like no more no more than you call the theory of gravitation a theory, but uh, no one is really contesting that. So the, the demonstration is very clear and there's uh, no really scientific way, way that this could uh, not be taking place. And then there's been a number of people that have worked on this, for example, uh, some interesting uh, self-taught uh, meteorologist and uh, physicist in England in the 1930s guy, Stuart Callender, who compared temperatures and CO2 concentrations. So basically what we do nowadays with the IPCC and hundreds of researchers, but he did this all by hand and found that there was a good correlation even in his time already. Um, there were scientists like Hermann Flohn in the 1940s already, a German uh, geo who warned of um, uh, the consequences of climate change that it might lead to, to uh, unpredictable and large uh, changes in uh, oceans for example and in the earth system in the 1950s people started doing uh, it was not yet really computer models because computer was a big word for what they had back then but it was a beginning of, of more uh, uh, physical climate Climatology, where people had uh, very uh, precise mathematical models to calculate increases of temperature uh, and the radiation balance. And you can see that his predictions that uh, uh, um, atmospheric CO2 would increase by about 30% over the 20th century and temperatures would increase by one degree Celsius is pretty much the same than what we know nowadays and the latest, latest uh, or the before latest uh, IPCC assessment reports, uh, we find that CO2 increased by 37% and temperature increased, increased by 0 0.7 degrees Celsius in the 20th century. So those uh, calculations made in the 1950s give, give pretty much almost exactly the same result than, uh, than what we have nowadays. Right. Well, and from there it started to become um, something that scientists became more and more interested. So there were quite a few uh, conferences starting in uh, 1965 was the first conference that was really a scientific conf conference on the causes of uh, climate change. And there was a big study in 1971 published. Uh, an article in Nature in 1972 that talked about the man-made carbon dioxide and the greenhouse effect. It was in 1979 a report of the uh, National Academy of Sciences that predicted there could be an increase in temperature by uh, 1.5 to 4.5 degrees Celsius if we double the amount of CO2 and that 
already said that a wait and see policy could mean that it is too late to act when we uh, decide to act. So that's in 79 already. And the famous uh, headline from Nature. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Nature, but it's one of the two most important uh, scientific publications, Nature and Science, and already in 1979, they had an editorial where they warned that the release of carbon dioxide to um, the atmosphere by the burning of fossil second. fuel. Um, so we've now gone over time. I just wanted to it's check in with everybody. The most important environmental um, issue in the world today. I know other things planned. Okay, well, that is great. To show so that and if anybody has any questions, uh, then um, it would be great to start thinking about them and get ready to like 10 years ago that we decided that climate change exists. It's been around for a long, long time, uh, the science, and it's really a pity that in coming decade, this uh, uh, scientific debate was uh, obfuscated so much by, uh, by false information and concerted campaigns. Of uh, disinformation that uh, were undertaken by uh, different people, fossil fuel and, and Fox News and those kind of people. And then the first uh, like worldwide conference that had to do with the climate was in 1979 in Geneva, organized by the World Meteorological Organization. Then there was a conference in Austria and Villach in 1985 where some politicians. Uh, met for the first time to uh, um, talk about having some action against climate change to have a treaty. And then there was um, in the, a few years after that, uh, the first really important climate change conference and that um, incidentally happened uh, in Toronto in 1988. Uh, that was the invitation of Brian Mulroney at that time where delegates from 46 different countries asked for a reduction of CO2 emissions by 20% to compare to 1988 levels by 2005. And so that kind of objective is what then became the basis for the Kyoto Protocol several, almost 10 years later. And of course, the uh, that is also at this conference that the creation of the uh, IPCC, the Intergovernmentary Panel on Climate Change, was uh, decided. So that was established uh, the same year and produced its first report in 1990 and has been producing several reports every like five or six years since then. The next one should come out within maybe two or three years from now. So that's uh, basically the best IPCC is really the best source of uh, information on climate change. Everything is in those reports, but they're not always very easy to read. So if you're not a scientist, it's, uh, it's a bit arduous to extract this information, except if you go to the policymaker summary, then whether they, they try to uh, express it in, in somewhat simpler terms. And 1992 was the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. Janeiro, so that seems like a long time ago nowadays, but that is where several big conventions, including the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, was signed. That was an agreement on principles to combat climate change and to adapt to it. In 1997 was the signature of the Kyoto Protocol that uh, aimed at reducing emissions by 6 to 7%. And compared to 1990 levels by 2008-2012 for, for all the industrialized nations. And of course, more recently, that was replaced in 2015 by the, uh, the Paris Accord that probably most of you are familiar with.
And it's an interesting observation that I always want to point out because uh, everybody says that the Kyoto, <clears throat> the Kyoto Protocol was a failure. But if you look actually that um, the, the red dots, it's the countries that are in Annex 1 and that agreed to uh, greenhouse gas tar targets. And you can see that collectively those countries actually did achieve all the reductions that they uh, uh, um, promised they would achieve. With some exceptions like Australia, Canada and the US did not fulfill their, uh, their promises, but all the other countries is, did. So it, it was actually very successful in its way. What was not anticipated is the strong growth of emissions from all the, the, the transition countries like China, India, Mexico, South. Um, Sid, I tried to unmute you, but I don't think South we Africa, can actually do Brazil, that. Um, there was a huge with, increase in uh, the way that it's set up right now. Greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the, the green curve that you see here. That's all the countries that were not at that time not considered important. And of course, the resulting emissions curve, the black curve on top, shows that there is a continuous emissions throughout the whole existence of the Kyoto Protocol at a worldwide level. But um, so, yeah, I, I'd like to see that in a more, more uh, differentiated way, the, the, the success of the Kyoto Protocol. And one thing, of course, that we should not uh, forget, those numbers are a little bit old, but they haven't completely changed. It's uh, who emits more or less greenhouse gases. If you look at the greenhouse gas emissions per capita, that means per person, You can see that uh, US and Canada, we emit like something close to 20 tons of carbon per person per year. And if you look at other countries in, in Europe, for example, they emit about half as much greenhouse gases. And China emits about a quarter as many greenhouse gases. And India like per person, it's, it's one tenth or so. Um, yeah, so for example, saying that Canada is not very important in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because there's so few people and we don't make any difference. Well, each one of us emits about 10 times as much as uh, any person in China. So, and, uh, sorry, in, in India, about four times as much as any person in China, and we haven't made much progress since 1990 on that. So it's really a false argument to say that because, of course, every person in the world counts uh, in equal terms. And there is a certain uh, world average that we, that we really need to respect in order to, uh, um, to have a leveling out of CO2 uh, emissions. So the moment the world average of 4.5 it's probably a bit higher by now around five or so but the, the really sustainable emission level would be rather around 0 0.3 or maybe one or two i think something like that so definitely we need to uh, cut our emissions much more than other countries <laughs>